Wainema National Forest is a sprawling one million acre woodland on the eastern side of Oregon's Cascade mountain range. It has a vast and varied landscape, with towering pine trees, sparkling lakes and snow-capped mountains. And it's the last place that Derek Engbretson was ever seen. This is the Case Remains podcast, episode three, The Disappearance of Derek Engbretson. On December the 5th, 1998, Robert Engerbretson headed out to the forest with his son, Derek, aged eight, and his 64-year-old father, Bob. It was an annual tradition for the Engerbretson men, who went there every year to find the Christmas tree that would decorate their home. That Christmas, however, Robert's wife, Laurie, had talked him into getting an artificial tree, less mess, she said, but when a disabled neighbour asked the Engerbretsons if they could get them a tree, they were happy for the chance to get out into the forest. Robert was an enthusiastic outdoorsman and had passed the passion on to his young son. No stranger to the great outdoors, Derek was just one week old when he went on his first bear hunt, strapped safely into his mother's pack. Derek had even earned himself the nickname Bear Boy and could often be found hunting or scavenging for mushrooms with his family. The trio left the house late that day, arriving after 2pm, which left them only a couple of hours to finish their task before it got dark. They parked up in Bob's red Toyota pickup, dressed Derek in his blue snowsuit and headed out into the forest. They started their search for that perfect tree on the mountainside of Pelican Butte, a steep-sided and densely wooded area almost 4,000 feet above Upper Klemath Lake. Derek and Bob set out on separate paths, with Robert walking ahead and telling Derek to stay with his grandfather. Derek stayed with Bob for a little while, chopping at small trees with his hatchet, before telling Bob that he wanted to go and catch up with his dad. Bob agreed, and with that, Derek was gone. Bob and Robert regrouped less than an hour later at around 3pm, when night was just starting to draw in. It was then that they realised that Derek was nowhere to be found. Each thinking the other had been watching him, the little boy had wandered off into the forest. Bob and Robert walked back into the woods, calling Derek's name and trying desperately to find him. By this time, snow had hit Klemath Falls, and less than 20 minutes after their search began, there was a whiteout, with a visibility of only a quarter of a mile. After over an hour of searching, Derek's father flagged down a driver, Fred Hines, at 4.13pm and asked him to go and call 911. Hines drove on to the Rocky Point Resort, about two miles away, to use their phone. Hines understandably had limited information about Derek, and when he couldn't tell the operator how old the missing child was, they asked him to go back to the road, asking him if he could go and get Robert to go to Rocky Point Resort and call them himself. In response, Hines said, quote, I highly doubt that he's out there looking for his kid, end quote. And to that, the operator said, quote, Well, he's not going to get any response if we don't get any further information, because we can't send out an army, end quote. A deputy was sent to the scene nonetheless, but the operator warned that because of the weather conditions, there was going to be a delayed response. At 4.28pm, the sun set over Oregon. Detective Bud Wilson, coordinator of Klamath County Search and Rescue, was finally called at just past 5pm, which is already more than two hours since Derek disappeared. He was off duty, on his way to the Search and Rescue annual Christmas banquet, and called the operator back on his mobile phone. Knowing what we now know about Derek's disappearance, the transcript of the call that followed is nothing short of infuriating, as Detective Wilson tells the operator that it's going to be hard to get a group together because some of the search and rescue team were already at the restaurant and the others are getting ready to go there. Not wanting to disturb the party, Detective Wilson asks if the deputies and the local fire chief can go and start a small search without them, saying he would keep checking in with the operator in case they found Derek and he didn't have to send any search and rescue people out unnecessarily. The state police requested that the road be ploughed, and by 7.30pm there were several deputies, fire department volunteers and five state troopers on the scene, armed with two snowmobiles to help them with their search. The snow had finally stopped falling, and at 9.16pm, George Kleinbaum, search and rescue coordinator, received a phone call from dispatch requesting he send a helicopter with infrared cameras. He immediately called Detective Wilson, who postponed the request. 
Within the next 15 minutes, six and a half hours after Derek went missing, 17 members of the Klamath County Search and Rescue Team arrived. Detective Wilson, who drove up the following morning, wasn't one of them. Derek's grandfather, an expert tracker, managed to retrace his steps back to where the pickup was parked. After going up the hill to a log deck, Derek had looped back around and down to the road, stopping to make a snow angel about a quarter of a mile in front of Bob's pickup truck. Cuts were also found at trees on the roadside, maybe made by Derek with the hatchet he had on him. But unfortunately, by that time, the snowplow had passed through, obliterating any other tracks that Derek had made. Robert didn't think that his son would have turned back into the woods once he reached the road, but his family were hopeful that if he did, he may have used his hatchet to build a shelter from the elements. Speaking to the press five days after Derek vanished, Ben Davis, his maternal grandfather, said, quote, These people are underestimating him. He's a mountain kid. End quote. Word soon spread of Derek's disappearance, and volunteers quickly grouped together to search the snow-covered mountain, which by that time was completely cloaked in darkness, and they continued to search day after day. Derek's mother, Lori, kept watch in a donated camper van at the edge of the woods, a bonfire burning brightly to help Derek find his way home. One night, delirious with exhaustion, she thought she saw Derek walking out of the woods towards her, waving and smiling, but sadly it wasn't to be. The volunteers found several potential clues in their searches. A makeshift shelter, a sweet wrapper and a bookmark from Derek's school, although none of these could be confirmed as belonging to Derek and sniffer dogs were unable to trace his scent. Ben Davis also found a hole in the ice on a lake, with a child's footprint on the bank. Divers searched the lake the very next day, and once again when the lake had thawed in the spring. Four years later, in 2002, diver Jeff Priest searched the lake several more times, armed with a special metal detector designed for using underwater. Priest thought that if he could find Derek's hatchet, there may finally be a clue as to what happened that day. His search turned up a road sign and an oil filter, but no hatchet. In the two weeks after Derek disappeared, hundreds of people, on snowmobile and on foot, searched Pelican Butte for the little boy. An Air Force helicopter with an infrared scanner combed the woods for any signs of life. But for police, the search was as good as over. After just eight days, they pronounced Derek dead, saying that there was no way he could have survived in the inclement weather, and that his remains must have been scattered by animals. With no evidence to suggest that Derek died in the woods, the Engelbretsons were convinced that he was abducted on that December afternoon. The volunteers soldiered on, but on December 18th this search was also called off, with the Engelbretsons concerned that the sub-zero temperatures were putting the volunteers at risk. For the next two years, Derek's parents devoted every spare moment combing the mountain for their son, keeping maps to mark areas that they had searched, and spending thousands of dollars on everything from psychics to search boats until eventually they went bankrupt. The Engelbretsons sold their house and moved to a 30-foot mobile home in Klamath Falls Trailer Park. Derek's disappearance also had a profound effect on his sister, Amy, who was 18 at the time he went missing. Once a straight-A student, she began to spend time away from home and experimented with drugs, though she eventually got clean and moved back in with her parents before starting a family of her own. Almost a year after Derek disappeared, people passing through Oregon's Sage Hen Rest Area called the police after noticing some unusual graffiti on a bathroom wall. The police have never revealed what it said, but described it as being Derek-specific. Part of the wall was removed and sent to the state crime lab to be tested for fingerprints or any other evidence, but an FBI profiler concluded that the writing was a cruel hoax. After driving the 250 miles to look at the graffiti herself, Laurie agreed, describing it as just a big sick joke. Sure enough, nothing ever came of it, and for a while the search for Derek went quiet. It was 2002 when it seemed that the case may finally have been cracked, when a letter arrived through the Engelbretsons' front door. The letter was from an inmate, claiming that not only was their son dead, but that he knew who had killed him. He gave the name of Frank Milligan, a former juvenile counsellor who was serving 36 years in prison for molesting an 11-year-old boy and for the rape and attempted murder of a 10-year-old boy. 
Milligan had abducted the 10-year-old from a Dallas park in 2000 before driving him to a secluded field and sexually assaulting him. He then choked him until he was unconscious and slit his throat, leaving him for dead. Miraculously, the boy survived. Speaking to police on the condition that he wouldn't be handed a death sentence, Milligan told the authorities where they would find Derek's body. The FBI used ground-penetrating radars to scan the Silver Fall State Park, about a five-hour drive from where Derek was last seen, but after several days of searching, they came up with nothing. When the search proved fruitless, Milligan recanted his confession and refused to sign his guilty plea. While no physical evidence has ever been found to link Milligan to Derek's disappearance, some witnesses did report seeing a 1998 black Honda, much like Milligan's, in the area at the time of Derek's disappearance. Police did search his car for clues, but they came back empty-handed. And though she hasn't publicly stated why, Derek's mother Laurie doesn't believe that Milligan murdered her son. He has since been sentenced to another 35 years in prison to run consecutively for the sexual assault of a 15-year-old inmate in 1999 at the youth authority where he worked. Crying before the sentence was delivered, Milligan claimed that he was innocent, but that the conviction was karma for his previous crimes against children. He declined the opportunity to apologise, however, and instead recited the poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley, reading, It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. The earliest that Milligan will be eligible for release is September 25th, 2071. Detective Nick Kennedy is now assigned to Derek's case. Speaking to KTVL this year, he said that the information they'd received in Derek's disappearance was the most they had for any cold case on their files. Oregon police have received tips from as far away as San Francisco and even as recently as last year. But still, Derek's whereabouts remain a mystery and no trace of him, his clothes or his hatchet have ever been found. In total, search and rescue teams have spent more than 10,000 man-hours looking for him. For the Engelbretsons, almost 20 Christmases have now passed without Derek, a once happy day now forever marred by tragedy. In many ways, life has moved on. Bob passed away in 2012, and Laurie and Robert are now grandparents themselves. Yet in the midst of change, one thing remains constant. The hope that come December 25th this year, Derek Engelbretson will have found his way home. Thank you so much for listening to episode three of Case Remains. If you're enjoying the podcast so far, I'd really appreciate it if you left an iTunes review, as it helps others to find the show. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle Case Remains, and you can visit our website at www.caseremains.com, where you'll find write-ups on missing persons and unsolved mysteries. I hope you all have a fantastic Christmas and New Year, and I'll be seeing you in 2019. Until next time, stay safe.